Hey, indie filmmakers, I'm Griffin Hammond. And I'm Alex Ferrari, director of the new film On the Corner of Ego and Desire. Today, I'll ask Alex to share his indie filmmaking experience, plus your questions about filming concerts, creating pretty text, and which microphone you should be shooting with, recording with. How you doing, Alex? I'm doing great, Griffin. Thank you, man. It's, it's an honor to be be talking to an OG YouTuber uh, in the <laughs> filmmaking space, sir. So you are one of the original gangsters in this space. So thank, well, thank you for you. having me on the show. <laughs> of course. It's an honor to have you on the show, especially since many of my listeners and viewers may know you from your podcast, one of your two or three podcasts. <laughs> I'm, your I'm, your I'm big one is Indie Film Hustle. Yeah, Indie Film Hustle. <laughs> Uh, the Indie Film Hustle podcast has been around for uh, going on almost three years now, uh, as as well as the blog as well. So, that, yeah, that's right. it. And I got the other podcast I just started a little while ago called The Bulletproof Screenplay. Right. Well, I was going to say, you have you have 252 episodes of the Indie Film Hustle podcast, but seeing how prolific you are, by the time I even post this interview, you, <laughs> <laughs> you may post two more episodes. <laughs> I'm, maybe I maybe I just posted one today. <laughs> There's another one coming out. <laughs> um, I do two episodes a week because I'm a madman. Um, and it was just a it, originally it was just a marketing strategy, just like you know everyone else right. is doing one, so I'll do two. Um, right. <laughs> no one else is doing two. Why not do two? So now I do three, including the bulletproof screenplay. And there right. might be. Um, there, I'm just saying there might be a couple more coming in the future. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure. Some of the questions I have for you today are from our audience, and some of awesome. them are about Indie Film Hustle. Great. But I want to start today by talking about the film that you are currently in the process of, although it sounds like you're mostly done with it. Yeah. Um, my f yeah, go ahead. This is your film, On the Corner of Ego and Desire. Yes, the um, the little film that could, as I like to say. Um, <laughs> uh, On the Corner of Ego and Desire is a film about... Uh, filmmakers trying to sell their movie at the Sundance Film Festival and I and my crazy crew which is two other people um, decided to actually go to the Sundance Film Festival and shoot uh, this year in 2018 Yeah, and um, we're the first narrative feature to ever do that <laughs> there's never been <laughs> there's never been a narrative feature film shot completely at a at a, a Sundance Film Festival there's been docs done but never a right. narrative because who in their right mind would do something <laughs> so luna it's a, it's lunacy it's absolute lunacy you know running around basically uh without permits just shooting around and my theory was this my theory was you know what it's Sundance everyone's going to have a camera there no one's going to look at us and i was right. so right i wish i would have brought my alexa like seriously, it was right. like I brought I shot the whole thing on a pocket camera, um, right? And it looks this is the black black magic pocket cinema camera. Yeah, the, exactly. And uh, we shot it at 1080. You know, I got some really funky old lenses on it, did it on a monopod, and just had my sound guy around us, and we labbed everybody, and we ran around Sundance for four nice. days, shooting. And for people that don't know, Sundance is the first, it's really the first film festival that kicks off the season. It's in January. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it's it's the one that, uh, it's the biggest one in the States, without question, um, and one of the top five in the world. Uh, yeah. You know, it's one of the most famous ones of them all. And, um, and yeah, so we just went there and ran around for four days shooting this movie, which was based on uh, an idea I had uh, because I had never seen... First of all, I had never seen a, f a movie about filmmakers trying to sell a movie. It's always about making right. a movie. So I thought, well, that would be interesting. I'm like, let me throw every mistake I've ever heard, every ridiculousness, every egomaniacal filmmaker that I've ever run into in my career, throw all of that into one movie and make it kind of like a spinal, this is spinal tap for filmmaking. Right. Um, and really be kind of like a satire of the whole, the whole process. And... Um, you know, like one of the producers. Well, first of all, I also did something else that no one had done because our director is female. So we had a female director who's the lead of the movie, basically. Um, okay. And I've never seen a female director in any movie about making movies. So I was like, why not? And she was uh, Sonia O'Hara. She was amazing. She is loony in this movie. The things that come out of her mouth, you're just <laughs> like, I can't believe someone would think this. And then when I shown it to a few people in the industry, they're like, oh, I know that person. I'm like, you know people like that? I'm like, oh, I've worked <laughs> with people like that. I'm like, that is scary because she is mad. So far, <laughs> so far off 
the, the reservation in regards to the ego, uh, and I'm sure you've met a few yourself, Griffin, in your day. Right. Um, that uh, I was just poking fun at it, and 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 it was such an adventure. It was a it was a blur because we were done in four days. Like we literally ran Jeez. around in four days and shot a 75 minute feature film. Um, and, and you told me before we started rolling, you edited this in six weeks. No, we did everything in six weeks. So when we got yeah. back, oh, uh, within six weeks, uh, I, I edited the film in a week. Um, I color graded it over the course of the next four weeks. During that process, we were doing sound design. I had my composer doing the com a composition and did everything because we were running up against a deadline, which is what I always preach. Don't ever rush for a deadline. But of course, as a filmmaker, I'm like, yo, no, I gotta do this, um, and I pushed self imposed my... deadline or was no, there... it was it was I was actually submitting to uh, can and uh, okay and uh, we did not get in, so um, but at as least so it was many a... films don't <laughs> as most indie films in the, <laughs> right. from the U S don't, but I was like, you know what, let's just roll the dice, of and course, uh, yeah. I put I pushed the team is fairly hard, but. I had professionals on every aspect of every place, you know, in this process. There was very few crew members, but every one of them were high end professionals. Um, and yeah. then, of course, I did a lot of heavy lifting myself because of my post production background and my camera background and all the other kind of stuff I do. So um, I was able to achieve that. So I had pretty much 95% of the movie done within six weeks. And then we just tweaked wow. things here and there. But it was all due to an amazing team that I'd gathered and that who believed in the movie because, right. you know, the pitch, this is the pitch. I, and by the way, I had to fly in all my actors from L.A., which <laughs> not from L.A., from New York, excuse me, from oh, New wow. York, because I'm in L.A. I'm like, because I can't find actors here in L.A., apparently, because every single time I would approach someone in L.A. and I told them about it and, you know, I told them who I was and what I've done. And they're like, well, you know, I don't know. And like. I called up three actors in New York, and all of them were like, "Yes, when do you want me?" And nice. um, and the the big selling pitch was like, "Look, um, we're gonna go to Sundance. You're gonna sleep in a, a really beautiful place, and um, I don't know what we're gonna do. We're gonna make this movie. It's based on a scriptment, so it's not a screenplay. It's based on a scriptment that I wrote, which has a very detailed or organized story structure, but it's a lot of improv as far as the right. dialogue is concerned." It's the is only way script you... meant like halfway between a script and a treatment. Yeah, basically, it's it's a very structured treatment um, yeah. where you know you have I had it was probably about ten or fifteen pages, and every scene is broken down like what has to happen in every scene. There's a full arc and things like that. But while we were there, we discovered who these characters were because we were with them, and then the actors brought in what they brought in, um, and then myself and my my DP Austin uh, Nordell, we started kind of seeing. What was happening because like day one like the night we got there that night we went out and started shooting stuff and we didn't use any of that stuff at that first right. night because we were just like should we shoot here for this scene all right let's take a look and it was really <laughs> the next morning when we sat down and like okay this is what this is and we ran with it um and it it was like we literally shot at sundance headquarters like we yeah. walked in the front door <laughs> shot a full scene in plain view of everybody and even went to the back, had the restaurant shut down, so and the music turn off, so we could do a scene back there. Nice. No one bothered us, yeah. and that was the one thing that I, I was so wonderful about Park City is that everybody, we asked anything, and they just yes. Do, do, yeah. do, you, do you need this? Do you need that? The complete opposite of LA. Right. Um, it's like a filmmaker positive environment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because in many ways, people who live in Park City, yes, they see Sundance, you know, 10 days out of the year, but overall, it's still pretty exciting for film, yeah. you know, for, for cameras. To see cameras and stuff like that for them is still pretty exciting. Um, not like at L.A., which they would have charged us left and right, and, you know, it would have never been able to do something like this. But we ran around. It was a blur. Um, it was it was the most liberating creative experience of my life it is the closest thing to uh who i am as a filmmaker that i've ever made because there's many scenes in that movie that are me you know yeah. one of one of our characters is walking down main street at six o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the morning while the snow is drizzling down and the, the streets are dead 
that was me in 2006 right. trying to figure out, am I doing the right thing? Am I a filmmaker? Why am I doing this? The conversation we all have at least once or twice in our, in our yeah. career. <laughs> um, but it comes from a place of, um, of love for filmmaking and every filmmaker I've shown it to everyone has a smile on their face pretty much the entire movie because <laughs> they get every single every single joke every single yeah. thing because it's I, I built this I built this um, film for my audience which is filmmakers and screenwriters and industry people so it is if anyone else outside of that industry catches it great but it's really designed for this audience uh, which is also what I preach. I'm like, if you're gonna make a movie in any movie, hit a hit a market of people who you know you know you can get to, like Sriracha. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but but that's what I did, uh, and we're gonna see how it all turns out. Because right now, it, I'm waiting. I'm waiting to release it uh, based on festivals. Because yeah, uh, you know, if there was ever a movie ever made <laughs> that should be festival friendly, it's this one. Yeah. Um, uh, so safe so to I'm say, hoping, this film will its premiere will be at a festival. I'm hoping. I'm hoping. Yeah, uh, you know, and, goal, and I'm yeah. and I'm a, and I'm aiming for a, you know, some of the larger festivals yeah. to see if we can get some more attention on the project and get you know just more attention to everybody involved, um, because it's a special little film, you know, and yeah. you know, I can't believe that we were able to do it. I st basically I never left Sundance, so every time right. <laughs> for like for months I kept watching it. I'm like I've, I've haven't left Sundance. <laughs> <laughs> It's always there. I'm always there. And whenever I told people, uh, um, well, first of all, anyone I told that I'm making a movie at Sundance, no one believed me. Uh, everyone's <laughs> like, what? Like I had an actor friend of mine who, uh, uh, um, RB from Stage 32, um, he plays a, a scene in the movie for me. And he was literally at a party because he was coming. He was going to come over about one o'clock in the morning to this scene in a big party that we were throwing. And he was at an industry party, I don't know, like CAA's party or whatever. Yeah. And he's like, we got to go. And like, what are you guys going to do? Oh, we're going to go shoot a scene for a movie. You're going to go screening a movie? No, no, no. We're going to go shoot a <laughs> scene for a movie. And you would just see their faces yeah, just, just turn. Doesn't... It doesn't compute. Like right. nobody. And when we were walking around Sundance, like I met, I see a lot of people. I know, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm shooting a movie. And they're like, what? <laughs> like, so it's so wonderful to be out so far out the box that nobody gets what you're doing right. until you can That's actually great. show it to them. <laughs> so you you mentioned how much of yourself is a part of this film and you've talked about some of the some of the roles that you played in this. You are a producer, you wrote this, you directed it, you edited it, you did color. One of our questions is from Johnny Bosworth on Instagram. He wants to know what your favorite aspect of the process of the filmmaking process is. Is there one of these that you feel most at home? I'm going to have to say post mm -hmm. because that's where I lived most of your, my life. Yeah. Your experience. I mean, I've been, I've been in post for 20 odd years. So I love the production standpoint. I love shooting. I love being with actors and creating, but where I'm at the most at home is, is behind a, a dark, in a darkened room, like a vampire in front of an edit system, yeah. um, editing and doing color and, and putting it all together. That's kind of where my first love is. But, you know, being on being on set, the craziness of what we were doing, running around, like literally jumping from location to location um, was so much fun in this movie. It was yeah. just, it was it was insane. And watching these actors just come up with these lines sometimes you're just like, that's brilliant. Oh, all right. Now throw this line in about the laser disc and uh, throw the, <laughs> you know, so I was just throwing in all these kind of like. Tell them that you watch Yojimbo on Laserdisc. That's really millennial. Go, go, go. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot you even have a cameo in this film, don't you? Uh, so yeah, unfortunately, I do. Uh, <laughs> I am in the movie uh, playing myself because, of course, my filmmakers are searching for this producer who I was interviewing for my podcast. So right. it's a grossly um, plug, a gross plug for my <laughs> podcast in the movie. You but actually like, like play well, yourself as the podcaster? I play Alex Ferrari from Indie Film Hustles podcast. Yes. <laughs> That's great. So it's it's such it's it's like it's like Reese's Pieces in ET. It is such <laughs> <laughs> such self um uh, product placement is not even right. funny. But when anyone asked me about it, I'm like, look, I didn't have another actor. Right. And it would have been foolish for me to hire an actor to play a podcaster. And then why would I make up a podcast when <laughs> I have a podcast and it's really kind of built for 
my audience. So I think it might be fun. So if you notice when you watch the movie, um, I cut myself out as much as humanly possible. So anytime I'm talking to someone, I'm like, you know, I'm framing myself out. Or I zoomed in and I, yeah. I, I tried. I tried the best I can not to be in the movie. But everyone <laughs> who's seen it, they, no one has argued. No one said that you've ruined the scene, Alex. So I'm playing right. myself. If I can't play myself, I've been practicing for 40 odd years. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah. I, I, I'm a horrible well, actor. My philosophy is always to play to your strengths and if you've been doing hundreds of episodes of podcasting, then you probably are the best person to be putting in that role. <laughs> you have the experience. I, it, wasn't, it wasn't hard. I really just kind of fell right into that, that role. Yeah. You know, you asked me to do something Daniel Day did. I'm probably not going to be your guy. But, you know, playing myself being a podcaster at Sundance, which I've done millions of times. Sure, I could do that. Yeah. We got a, uh, a question from Joe Bean on Instagram wondering if you have any specific techniques that you would consider like your signature. It could be a specific shot type you like, editing technique, any lighting things that feel um, unique. I really love uh, the wide angle lens. It's something really, yeah. really that I, I love. And in this movie, uh, I've used it throughout my career, but in this movie specifically, I used a lens called the Canoptic 5.7 millimeter lens, which I wow. I called it the Kubrick, because it is the <laughs> the baby brother of the the Canoptic 9.3 or 9.2 or something like that lens that Kubrick shot Clockwork Orange, The Shining, all this stuff, which is yeah. basically a wide angle that doesn't fisheye. So the wow. angle is so wide, it it's insane. And with the pocket camera which is a Super 16 sensor, that lens, which is a Super 16 lens, makes it stunning. And we brought right. that on. And well, <clears throat> I told my my DP, I was like, oh, we can't bring this. This is just too extreme. He's like, oh, we're bringing it. Oh, we're bringing it. This is happening. <laughs> and then we ended up using it as a signature throughout the movie. And, and you can see it. Right. Like there's scenes where even in the trailer where you see these close up shots of them, like, you know, going through torture uh, and all this kind of stuff in the movie and it worked out beautifully and everyone's like oh how are you gonna cut with it, it cut fine it cuts yeah. beautiful so <laughs> you know and because of the kind of movie it is which is about cinema and about filmmaking I thought I could kind of play around a little bit with genre so there are right. many different techniques in, in the making of, of on the corner of ego and desire so I have my Kubrick scenes I have my Cassavetti scenes I have all these other kind of styles throughout the movie where you know we break the fourth wall we do a, there's yeah. there's a bunch of different techniques in the movie so it really is an homage to uh to filmmaking and independent filmmaking yeah well and i love a wide angle lens because i, I love the way it distorts people's faces when you get up close Great. it's interesting it's interesting that's yeah. the thing it makes it it makes you stand out of the crowd and it's an interesting lens you know we used the three lenses we used was a sigma 18 to 35 art lens oh, um yeah. which is my that's my, a very popular one it's my go-to lens so i would say probably 75 percent of the movie shot with that um yeah. off of a speed booster we're gonna get technical a speed booster on <laughs> the um on the um, uh, pocket camera. So I got that extra stop and change, which helped at night and helped in dark areas because we didn't have a lot of time for lighting. Uh, it, right. Actually, we had no time for lighting, um, except yeah. for a few scenes. And, and then I also shot with a Anginu 12 to 120 uh, 16 millimeter zoom. And it's just, it's gorgeous. It's just gorgeous little, it's just, it's, it's, and it looks badass because the lens is like out to here. Right. And, and then with the, it looked like I literally had like a, a cannon uh, with my little black magic. Well, yeah, setup. I saw a picture of you on Instagram holding the black magic pocket cinema camera with one of those big lenses on. That was the Sigma. That was just the Sigma. Yeah. Uh, but the angle yeah. of it looked like it was this monster right. lens. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that was the image which got retweeted by Sundance oh, nice. <laughs> because I tagged Sundance on it and they said, we love this. I'm like, well, I can't wait for you to see it. I'm like, I'm like, right. like a complete, like I'm 20 years old. And you know, it was like, did what? you post that picture like during production? No, while that was posted like oh, later? a few weeks ago. I just like, you know what? Just yeah. let everybody remind everybody that, you know, ego is still right. around and stuff like that. And they just hit it up. So um, it has been submitted to Sundance. So yeah. we'll see. Um, yeah, but people said if it doesn't get a Sundance, Slam Dance will just pick it up just to screw Sundance. Right, right. 
So hopefully we will have a screening at Park City this year or uh, next oh, year. Yeah. That'd be amazing. <laughs> that would, dude, so that would I'm be a, a dream. How meta, how meta would it be to watch a movie about Sundance at the Egyptian where there's a scene right off right. of the Egyptian? <laughs> like the Egyptian is in your poster for the film. I know. It would be such a meta moment. Um, yeah. It, like I said. I feel it, like film festivals love meta. Well, this is as meta as you can get. Um, and yeah. you know what? Like I said, it is a special movie. I've never seen anything like this. Um, it does take a, a, a fair amount of cojones to even attempt <laughs> something like this because it's maddening. Like People are like, how yeah. about logos? I'm like, logos, schmogos, I don't care. We'll work <laughs> about it in post. And we cleaned out a few logos, but overall I just left everything in because I, I, why not? <laughs> I'm a yeah. little movie. Come get me. I don't care. <laughs> come on. I'm like, come on. We shot this little. The budget was nothing for this movie. It was nothing. It was a, as yeah. micro budget as you can get. Um, so, you know, you just got to be brave. I guess, I guess that's, as yeah. you get older, you just don't give a crap anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you define the phrase micro budget? Uh, man, people always say like, oh, I did a micro budget movie. It was 200000 I'm like, you know what? Go F yourself, dude. All right. Listen, man. <laughs> 200,000 is not a micro budget, okay? It might be compared to like Avengers, but right. not compared to the world I live in. I would say micro budget is 50,000 and below. You know, yeah. and I would argue that that's still low budget. I would say maybe even 15 and below, 20 and below are are micro budgets, but my first film was done for under 10. Yeah. Um this one was done uh, a respectfully low number. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so So for a film like this, what are the what is the money mostly going towards? What are the big expenses you have? Um the expenses on this well, I owned all the cameras, I owned all the post. Yeah. Um we uh a little bit of audio post. Um and uh basically like food. Food and travel yeah. cuz I flew out right. everybody to to um to Sundance. But my my producer has a condo on Main Street, which is the, one of the big nice. main reasons I decided to do this. I was like, right. I, I turned to him one day. We were talking about interviews we're going to do for the podcast. And I'm like, I've got a crazy idea. He's like, continue. And I'm like, <laughs> I think I think it'd be irresponsible of us not to shoot a movie this year at Sundance. Yeah. And he's like, continue. <laughs> and then we... <laughs> We kind of pitched it out like that. And he's like, I'm in. Let's do it. And, you know, he has this beautiful, beautiful um, apartment uh, condo that you can see in the movie where he throws a big party every year and it's a big industry thing. So I was like, let's just shoot something here and, and we'll just run around Sundance. We'll make something along the way. He's like, all right. So, nice. um, like I said, when I got here with all this footage, I didn't know what I had. I mean, I kind of knew what I had. I'm like, I hoped I had everything. And I'm going to say that out of everything that we shot, I only missed one shot that I really wanted. Uh, yeah. Everything else was pretty much there. And I got I could work around it. But until I started editing, I did not know. And I was literally probably 70% through. And I'm like, I don't know what I have. Let me just keep going. And it started to kind of come alive and it and that's an exciting kind of thing because you don't it's it, it's crazy it's crazy um and if you're gonna have two hundred thousand dollars you don't do this process you do right. this process as an experiment and this was it was an experimental film i'm like let me see what happens till i finally put it all together and i would say out of the first cut everyone who all my uh my collaborators i had them all watch it i'm gonna say that it was about 80 percent there it was yeah. just literally just let's move this scene here, let's move this scene there, and kind of stuff. And it was it was like you've got it, and there's emotion, and you get the story, and there's an arc, and you feel for these people. And you're like, oh my god, it worked. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> at least we think so. We'll see what everybody else <laughs> thinks. So I'm I'm a tech nerd, and I'm real curious about mm -hmm. you know use the black magic pocket cinema camera. I'm curious what were you shooting in ProRes or no, uh, raw? yeah no 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 raw. Yeah, I was shooting. I was shooting 1080p raw because I'm a yeah. colorist, so right. I, I need I need raw. And and, and also yeah. you can't it, you can't do this kind of movie without raw because raw saves your ass so much. Like yeah. if I would have shot this pro res, I, there's scenes I would have just like you could tell I edited it in a week. 
<laughs> but it took me four weeks to color grade because yeah. uh, I'm a colorist. I'm like, okay, we got to come up with this. And I'm power window <laughs> over here, slash over there. And, um, and then just coming up with the look with my, uh, with my DP. And, um, and then he also trusted me because a lot of DPs would not want to put their name on something so experimental, but he worked with me before and he knows my work and he's like, look, I know yeah. you're not going to make, I know this will look good at the end of it. I'll give it to you. Right. I'll give you the I'll give you the meat. You cook it up nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you, do you use DaVinci Resolve? I do everything in DaVinci Resolve now. That is my yeah. post production solution now. So I edit in DaVinci Resolve. Uh, I color grade, and uh, do all my mastering there. Now they just recently released it with the visual effects fusion inc- incorporated and also audio. Uh, there's just only so much I can do in one day, <laughs> so I can't right. learn everything. <laughs> um, so, but for editing, it's it's amazing and for color it is the, the industry leader not having a round trip are you saying you also use it for editing oh no that's all yeah that's all that's my only editing yeah. system wow i don't edit on anything yeah. else i'm an old fi- i'm a, a final cut pro guy and yeah when i i, I was a holdout up until like two years ago <laughs> i was a holdout till finally like this big project showed up i'm like oh I can't, I don't want to go to premiere. I don't want to, I don't want to. I'm not going to final cut X cause no. And I'm like, what? I'm like, well, I'm, I know Da Vinci already. And there's this little edit tab. I keep passing every day. Yeah. Let me see. So my first film, this is Meg, which was shot on the, uh, black magic 2.5 cinema. Uh, I shot that in raw and I was like, well, I know I have to, if I can't, I'm not going to be able to edit this in Final Cut. So let me just start editing. So I literally trained myself while I was editing my first feature on Da Vinci. Uh, and right. it, it was so seamless and so wonderful being able to jump from color to edit and back and forth to see right. what things looked, how things worked. If sometimes, Because, you know, you edit sometimes and then you take it to color like, that's not going to match. And then you got to go back and it's a pain in the ass. So I would be able to do that in the editing process. Um, it was wonderful. And then I got this huge job for Hulu and I did, you know, this, it's a monster job, a series, a full series, did everything in Hulu. After that, I got another series, did everything in that. And I was like, well, this is my thing now. So, uh, yeah. I, I love it. I love it. And I know a lot of guys out there are premier guys. Hey, I'm a Mac guy. Other people are windows guys. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Whatever tool that works for you is great, but, uh, you can't beat free. Right. Uh, I have the studio version, which is a whopping two ninety nine, but it's free for everything yeah. I've done. Pretty much is free, so right. you can't beat that. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. A lot of times when people ask me what is some free editing software, I say, well, DaVinci Resolve is super powerful and it is free. It, it's insane, and they literally just added Fusion for free, and and an a complete Pro Tool style audio system for free. And I was talking to him the other day, and like I just updated to 14, and like two weeks later, 15 shows up. I'm like, God, God, Jesus, slow down. It's like you're like overachievers, man. Just calm the hell down. Uh, but I am looking forward to their new, um, the new pocket camera. I saw it at NAB. Oh, yeah. oh I yeah. held it, I held it in my hand. I'm like, oh, this is this is it. That camera, I think, will change. I think that's a game changing camera. At 12.95, yeah. it's basically. And it looks like it has all the features you would need. It's 4K raw and ProRes yeah. in the size of And a has DS- a USB. <laughs> it has everything. I mean, it has sorry, everything. not USB. I mean XLR. <laughs> yeah, it has XLRs. It is basically a full, it's basically a DSLR, but with raw yeah. and, pro, and ProRes capabilities, which are non-existent in the DSLR world. And you get to use all your lenses and all that. Oh, forget, yeah. it. forget it. I mean, that's just, <laughs> just stop. <laughs> <laughs> but I still would have shot with the pocket camera, even if that other one was available because of the look of the Super 16 sensor. It yeah. gave that whole like 90s indie film scene like Clerks and Mariachi and right. all that and, and, and Reservoir and all that kind of, uh, you know, slacker. I wanted to go after that 90s look. Um, there's some black and white in the movie. Um, so I really wanted to kind of play with that. Uh, and that yeah. a lot of people was like, it looks like something that came out in the 90s. I'm like. That's exactly what I was going for. <laughs> for guys like you and me who even know what we're talking right. about. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I'm sure it's encouraging for a lot of people to hear that this really was a micro-budget uh, camera system you were using. I mean, the, the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera, when it came out, was nine ninety nine. Yeah, 1000 bucks. I bought mine used your... for like 700 bucks. A, ca- a yeah. full, A full package for like 750 bucks. 
and right. I bought the juice boxes, um, the juice box power. You plug it in. I'm not kidding you, Griffin. All day. All wow. day. I plug it in, left it on all day. I mean, we change batteries, if, if ever, once a day, and that's yeah. after maybe seven hours. That's a huge deal because, yeah, the – that camera, that was always the biggest problem for me as a documentary guy. I couldn't even shoot an interview with it because it would cut out after 15, 20 minutes. Right. But if you have a power source with it, yeah. like yeah. that, that juice box is like a hundred bucks. Right. It's you're golden. You're golden. And then after that, you still have got whatever time is in the internal battery, which is probably another five minutes. No, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> which is, you know, maybe another 15, 20 minutes after that. So it is uh it was shocking how amazing that little camera were and we literally walked around with a monopod everywhere yeah. there was never a tripod ever <laughs> yeah <laughs> when shooting with that with camera so one of the big gaps in my ability is i feel like i'm decent at shooting and editing but i've never really learned color i've definitely never learned da vinci resolve mm -hmm. and so i'm kind of curious as someone with a lot of experience in this is is color subjective I mean, I'm sure it's a combination or is it, or is there kind of a, a right and wrong way to color? There is a right and wrong, but there yeah. is also a level of subjection to it. But overall, I mean, what I love about the difference between why I've stopped doing a lot of editing, like I don't edit for clients anymore. I refuse to. Yeah. Uh, I do mostly post supervision, VFX supervision, color grading, online editorial, which is just the finishing up of things because Creative editorial, there is just a thousand million ways you can go. Yeah. Uh, and it's completely subjective and it drives you mad, especially when you have 40 producers on uh, a project, which I'm sure you and I both understand. Uh, so it's, and, and the money you can make off of, uh, on a freelance standpoint, off of editing a feature versus color grading a feature, we're talking yeah. about two months versus four or five days. So that's yeah. a massive difference in skill, uh, not skill set, but in the skill set itself. So uh, when it came to coloring, um, you could, you have, there is no, you could just look at the screen and go, is it pretty? Do you like it? Yes or no? It's not like, oh, well, this edit here, can we move a frame? No, 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 there's no frames. Right. What do you think? Does it, do you like it? Great. Yeah. If you don't like well, it. Well, and most people we probably can... don't have the vocabulary to even Argue. Describe for you how to change it. Like I need it to be more blue. <laughs> like, <laughs> like uh, yeah. Can you can you give me a little cooler vibe? I'm like, sure, we could do that. There you go. Done. Yeah. You, do you want it cooler? Oh, all right, little boop. All right, there you go. Right. And it, it's 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 very uh, you know one plus one equals two. Um, there is no question about it because the image is there and the and the the approval is there and it's done. Um, you know when I just did a I just did a project where the DP wanted it to look more. Uh, Tony Scottish, meaning much really intense man on fire domino yeah. style stuff, which is a colorist. I'm like, yay, let's go, <laughs> you know. And we did, but then of course, when the the studio got a hold of it, the studio was like, the trailer is nice, but you got to tone back the stuff. This is television; we can't do doing that. Blah, blah, blah. So <laughs> then I had to bring it back, and and that was just the trailer. So when I did the full the full thing, the series, I was able to bring it back and stuff. But that's where you where you come up with with color but uh it is a little bit subjective but much less subjective than creative editorial yeah so we got a question about your your empire and your podcast your indie film hustle <laughs> <laughs> well i say that because uh the question from worldwide wong i don't know if he's talking about your podcast or your overall indie film hustle brand but he just says he wants to know what led you to create it and if you expected this outcome um, what, what led me to create it was first I want, I, I've been helping filmmakers make movies since Oh five with my hmm. very first short film where I released the DVD that had a guerrilla film school on it when there, and you know, as well as I do in 2005, there was nothing, there was no information. YouTube was just starting out. Um, there was nothing available and I looked yeah. and I was like, you know, I want to help filmmakers. And I did that movie with the DVX 100 a. Yeah, edited on Final Cut Pro five or four or whatever it was back right. then, and I like I had never seen anyone create um, a product that will help filmmakers make a real indie movie. Not Robert Rodriguez's Ten Minute Film Schools, which are wonderful, but dude, you know you got seven million bucks for Desperado. I, I I'm not in that world, um, so I created it and we did very was very successful with it. So, but of course ego. Uh, 
plays a part. And I was like, well, I'm not going to be the tutorial guy. I'm a filmmaker. I don't need <laughs> to be doing this. Um, you know, that was nice for that project. But I, I need to build my career as a, a serious filmmaker. Where if I would have stayed on that path, um, can you imagine in 2005 if I would have been creating tutorials about filmmaking and it kept going? Kind of like what Rocket Jump did when they started in 2010. I would have owned <laughs> the whole air. Yeah. I would, I would, I would be the OG dude, and I would have owned the entire niche. But unfortunately, I did not. Um, but I'd always loved filmmaker, helping filmmakers, um, and being in post, seeing so many filmmakers come through my doors over the years, seeing their trials and tribulations, seeing their egos, um, seeing um, all the hardships that went through it. I was like, you know what? I, I don't. Uh, I don't see anything out there, at least from my perspective, that is telling people the truth about the industry. Right. And from someone who has kind of some street cred, I've been around a little bit. I'm not by any means the end all be all, but I've but done you do a few have hundreds of IMDb credits. <laughs> <laughs> I paid for all of them. They're all fake. No. Um, <laughs> but um, but yeah, so I'd been around. I'm like, you know what? Let me just throw my hat in the ring. And at that time, three years ago. I had been looking for something else to do because I was kind of burned out of what I'd been doing. And I was like, you know what? Let me see what I can do. And I opened up, I read a book called The Four Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And that book kind of showed me that there was a possibility of creating an online business. And I started in nine months or a year before I read that book and I started absorbing anything and everything about online marketing, everything about online businesses. And I just absorbed it all. And of course, I was still an idiot, thank God for my wife. I was like, you know what? I'm going to create an online business. I'm going to be like the jelly bean dude. I'm like, but you don't even like jelly beans. I'm like, no, I know, but I'll just create a business. I'm like, so anybody wants the jelly bean podcast. And I'm like, but you don't like jelly. Why don't you talk about film? I'm like, I don't know. Let's... <laughs> That's so on the nose. And she's like, you're an idiot. You're an absolute idiot. Do something with film. I'm like, all right, all right, all right. And, I, and then I came up with Indie Film Hustle. Yeah. And then I was like, you know, this is kind of I'm like, this is the path I need to be on. So um, I wanted to create a, a resource with the podcast and also with the blog to really help filmmakers out in a true, raw, honest way. No BS, no nothing in your face because that's what the business is like. Yeah. The business is not. Well, it's not like what they teach you in film school. We're like, you know, it's gonna you do get an internship and then you do this and then you get that. And like, no, that's not the way they do it. They yell at you, they beat you up, they tear you apart, um, they will crush you. Uh, and if you've got an ego, anytime I see any filmmaker with a big ego or you know who's an ass or something like that, I'm like, don't worry, <laughs> it'll all sort itself out. Right. It'll all sort itself out because it it just does. It's yeah. called karma. People and will stop working with you. People will stop working with you because you might be hot right now, but the moment you trip, it's gone. And they will they just looking for an excuse not to work with you. Right. Um and that's what happens because no one can be on, you know, all the time. There's very few filmmakers have never made a bad movie. Yeah. Um there's yeah. arguably only a few. Um and generally, uh, most people do. So um, that's what I wanted to create. And I created the podcast and I came out, you know, kind of with guns a blaring and just said, hey, you know, hey, this is who I am. This is what I've done. And let's talk. And I just started creating um, episodes about things that were important to me as a filmmaker. And then I started interviewing people who I wanted to talk to right. selfishly. Like, yeah. I just want to talk to these people. <laughs> like, you know, I'm like, I just want to talk to these people and see what they're all about and and um, and and ask the questions that I would ask. And I'm like, wait a minute. You mean this podcast is now giving me the ability to sit down with the writer of Fight Club <laughs> for an hour and a half and talk about how it was like working with David Fincher and fanboying out for 30 minutes before we talked about the craft of how he cr constructed one of my favorite films of all time. <laughs> this is kind of cool. Yeah. Um, so over the course of over 250 episodes that I've done now, um, I've learned a whole lot more than I did when I started and have made relationships and everything like that. But I think at the end of the day, the main reason I wanted to do this is to be of service to my community, which are filmmakers and, and creatives. And I got tired of watching creatives and filmmakers just get destroyed by this business. Yeah. And uh, I hope that my resource of Indie Film Hustle, the podcast, uh, Bulletproof Screenplay, and anything I else I do or create, my first and foremost is 
being of service. It's not money. It's not trying to sell them something. If you look at my 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 world or mm-hmm. the, the brand, ninety five percent of what I have is free. Right. And I charge for five percent of it. Yeah. Of, of you know that's it. So I give a lot, and I'm I'm really trying to help out, and I truly do mean that. And anyone who listens to me will know that. Like, okay, he's, I'm not I'm not like, hey, I'm gonna get right. you for five bucks. I'm like, dude, come on, seriously, you know, I'm gonna try to provide you the best value as possible. Uh, and in all honesty, just try to help you in yeah. any way I can. Well, I so that's the main I feel reason served why. because I. A, one question I get a lot on this podcast is like how to get a film on Netflix. And that was actually the subject of your one of your recent episodes. And so I listened to that and I was like, oh, this is good stuff. This is good to know. I want to get my film on Netflix. <laughs> it is. Uh, yes, exactly. And those are relationships I've been able to make over the course of th- these last three years where I c- called up Neil. I go, Neil, I want you on because you're the Netflix dude. I, I, I need you to come on and let's just talk about Netflix. He's like, all right. And- yeah. I'm like, this is really valuable stuff, and it really helps out filmmakers. Again, because I'm a filmmaker and I'm not just a host, um, I'm looking for guests and asking questions, the things that I want to know about. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the big difference as opposed to just booking a guest for, oh, we've got to promote this movie or promote them. like, no, I, I don't do that. I, I look for people who can provide value to my audience and in turn hopefully provide a little value to myself as well. Right. Um, uh, and that's why I love what you do so much because you have that same kind of energy and heart behind yeah. what you do. Well, yeah, I feel like my motive is the same. I want to help people. But like you mentioned, you get this great side effect where you end up learning all these skills that you put into your own work. When you teach people, you're forced to learn a lot yourself. And also, I, I can tell you this, that the second I started Indie Film Hustle, my entire career changed. Whereas... Yeah. Doors opened for me that would never have opened without the podcast, without the blog. And, um, you know, I, I shot, I've shot two features in the last two years and I had never shot a feature prior to that. Um, right. It was because of Indie Film Hustle, because of my audience, because of the tribe that I built over the years. And, you know, in a lot of ways, the fearlessness that I have when I make my movies, um, because both of them were micro budget, both of them were experiments, um, I always just say, well, I have Indie Film Hustle, I'm good. Like if, if, if yeah. all else fails, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. I just keep, go back and I'm like, look, guys, I failed. And this is how I failed and why I failed. And let's learn and let's move on. And that takes someone who's been around the block a couple of times. 20 year olds are generally not having that conversation with right. themselves. Maybe some 20 year olds nowadays because I was an idiot when I was 20. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, and, and, and that's kind of the, the fearlessness of it because I know that I have my tribe to fall back on and and uh, and they know that uh by listening to what i put out and, and and absorbing and consuming the content that i put out that i've got their back in a, in, a, in a certain way at least and i know a lot of filmmakers i've talked to they're like alex i was making my movie and i was listening to your podcast every day just to hear you know encouragement and to move on because it's you know i've been doing this for six months and all this stuff and i do think that there there is something to be said by seeing someone do it because it's the four minute mile thing. No one broke that four minute mile till that right. one dude broke the four minute mile. And then <laughs> the year later, like five other people broke that four minute mile. But before then, yeah. it, it couldn't be done. So I feel it's my responsibility to show independent filmmakers um, what can be done from this point. Not my last name's not Spielberg. Um, you know, I didn't mm-hmm. get any, I don't have, I, I'm literally on the ground level like everybody else. I'm hustling trying to get out there um and i want to prove to everybody like look if i could do it anyone can and that's kind of the moment the mode i've done with my first two features yeah yeah and i keep discovering how important that is whenever i go do a talk or something Mm -hmm. people will come up afterward and say something like that that reminds you that oh yeah people just need needed to be able to see that it's possible now Mm -hmm. they know they can go do it it's it's so valuable and if they see someone who's doing it that is that they can relate to you know yeah. we you know our generation we saw robert rodriguez with El mariachi and every that's a mythical story the seven thousand dollar feature that he got the studio deal and it's right he owns the f- world now uh, <laughs> you know and that's a, and i always call that the lottery ticket you know the kevin smith the spike lee's the Rick, richard link letters the quentin tarantino's they're lottery tickets in a time where lottery tickets were being given out left and right in the right. early 90s 
um, or in the 90s in general, but the early 90s, it was like every Sundance, boom, you know, a new <laughs> a new guy just showed up. Um, where that was cool, and we kind of made it, we kind of like looked at Kevin Smith like, well, if he made a Clerks for 27,000, <laughs> I could go out and make a movie, right? Yeah. Um, but uh, not a lot of people did. <laughs> you know, it's it's hard. It's a lot easier now. I mean, literally. I mean, yeah. he, he's the still technological sh- barrier is a lot easier. Yeah. Oh my god! It's like there is no real. There's really no excuse. You educate yourself right. enough, you can go out and make a movie. There is yeah. no or series or content. There's no no excuse anymore. Um, but in the '90s, there still was somewhat of an excuse. Right. You know, I mean, the, when the DVX showed up, everyone was like, "Oh my god, look at this! <laughs> it's like film." Like, no, it's right. not. But it looks really good. And that yeah. little camera did make some beautiful images. You shot with that, oh, yeah. I'm assuming, right? I've used that one, yeah. That I used a, that my first job, I used a DVX. And it was so just... That with, and then you hooked up the cable to the Final, the final Cut Pro, digitized it in, <laughs> right. you know, with time code, you know, so you could go back and batch it if you need. Oh, it was, it was good times. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of tech stuff and serving the audience, yes. uh, we have three questions here that we can finish out today's show with. Sure. The first one is an email from Brandon, who is wondering if we can help him with a struggle he's having recently. He says he recently finished a project and looking back at it, he's embarrassed by the titles that he created. So he says he struggles to choose a good font, a color, stroke versus no stroke, do I bevel, drop shadow. (laughs) And he says he always ends up with something that looks like even the 1990s would reject it. (laughs) Oh, that's pretty rough. That's pretty rough. So that's where he he's, he knows he has a problem, but he doesn't know how to solve it. Like, I guess, what is your philosophy on titles? Um, I've always been very graphically inclined. So I create yeah. generally most of my work. All the artwork on Indie Film Hustle is mine. And anything, any artwork yeah. you see is, is me. Um, I'm not professionally trained by any stretch of imagination, but one of my good friends uh, who is a, a graphic designer um, I always send everything to him. Like, how's it look? He's like, good. You, you, before he'd be like, you know, just do this here, do that there. And I'm like, okay, great. But I generally had a good eye for that kind of stuff. Graphic design is a very unique thing and not everybody has an eye for it. So you have to understand when you're not capable of doing it. Um, there are so many resources now that they have, um, you go to creative market and you could buy fonts pre-built. You could buy, uh, after effects projects that are pre-built. Um, that look great. You can go to Fiverr and have someone do it for you for five or 10 or 15 bucks. Um, there are multiple places where you can go. I don't do sound. I do everything, but I don't do sound. I know that is a weakness of mine, Nor, and yeah. I do not want to ever learn it. I hate it. <laughs> I don't like it. I respect it, and I love listening to it, but I will not go into the weeds in it. I've tried it, yeah. don't like it, I'm out. So I know that I have to find someone to help me with that. Um, and... There are other areas of filmmaking that I just don't do. As you know, you shouldn't do everything. Um, yeah. I do a lot, though, but I don't do everything. So find out what is a weakness of yours and then get help within that in that world. Because if you can't if you if you're if you're making something that doesn't look good to you, um, then you need to find help somewhere else. And if you have the money to hire a professional graphic designer, there's a lot of places with that website, the one that you could hire anything to do anybody like um, Fiverr. Not Fiverr. That one's the other one, but there's another one. Um, there's another one. I, I, I'll, I'll if I remember it, I'll, I'll give it to you for sure. the show notes. Um, but you could hire people online all around the world at very affordable prices to do graphic design for you. The graphic design yeah. is not a a. Uh, there's no barrier to entry now with graphic design. Right. So you could do it super cheap on your own, or hire someone super cheap to do it. Or if you want to go a little bit higher end, you could still hire someone to do a graphic treatment for you. Uh, but yeah. that's what I would suggest. Well, and I used to make really complicated graphics, but I find myself now just finding a font I like. Right now, I really like the font Gotham. And Gotham's a great font. <laughs> I'll just do it in white. Yep. And if it needs a drop shadow, maybe I, it won't even have any blur. It'll just be a flat, you know, straight edge drop shadow. Right. If I have to, maybe I'll put it on top of a black box or something. But right now, I'm doing a lot of really flat, simple graphics, and that seems to be... Mini- minimalist. Yeah. I've noticed that the in general, like on YouTube and in movies, the fancy like I'm going all over the place kind of style is is right now not it. There is a lot of right. desaturation. 
um, kind of like that raw look uh, yeah. that's going around with a lot of filmmakers. Um, and I think that's just a... I think it's just a switch right now. It's, it's the fad right now, and I think fonts are the same thing. I try not. I, I used to get all funky with my right. thumbnails and fonts, and oh, like, but then I started slow. Then like, you know what? Clean is better, you know. And that's yeah. something that look at websites. Remember Flash? Yeah. Like all that ridiculousness <laughs> of Flash and running all over the place. Where now, I mean, all websites, all WordPress sites, or um, what's that other site? Um, Oh God! The, the other side that's pre-built stuff like um, like Squarespace and Wix. Squarespace, thank you. Yeah, Wix or Squarespace, they are all basically the same. Like you know, they're all very clean, very organized. There's no f- ridiculousness anymore, generally yeah. speaking, um, because I think that's just the style of where people are going. Because right. um, in a, in in a world where we're being bombarded with so much visual stimulation, um, if you're too out there, I think. People just get turned off by it. I think simple yeah. is better, especially when you're trying to grab their attention. Uh, when you're trying to grab their attention and um, get what you're trying to say as quickly as possible because you're only going to get that eyeball for a second or two. Right. So I think the short answer is no bevel. <laughs> no, but yeah, so short answer, no bevel. Um, no star wipes. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> Our next question is from Warren, who... Is in Los Angeles, probably not far from you in Hollywood. Uh, okay. He this is actually a follow up to a question he sent us a week or two ago. He was shooting a concert, and he says that he was bringing nine cameras. It seems like a lot to me. It seems a bit, a bit much. <laughs> Eight of which will be on tripods. Uh, he's hand holding the last one. He's getting audio on several of them with microphones on a couple of them. But then he's also plugging in an audio recorder to the board with two XLR cables, and he's recording. I guess the show is being produced in, in stereo. And uh, I guess he was wondering if he should also plug in the microphone on top of the audio recorder to get even one more feed. Um, man, um, I, I'd say no. Uh, <laughs> yeah, short it seems like overkill. I think, I think you're good, man. I think you're good. I uh, think nine cameras, unless it's, you know, you 2 or the Rolling Stones, you know, I think, right. I, you know. I think you're good with would seven be okay? <laughs> would would six be too much? You yeah. know because you have to. I I I I'm a post guy, so I think about the end right. game. So nine camera feeds, it's gonna be massive amounts of footage that you're gonna be dealing with, and you have to ask yourself, how much am I really gonna use camera eight? Right. <laughs> you know, like really, like you know, will six do? Will five yeah. do with a floater? I mean, it's fair I to say that probably two to three would be the minimum. You could definitely make yeah. the video with that. So, yeah, everything on top of that that you're adding is just extra editing. Arguably, arguably, okay, now we're going to beat this poor guy up, but <laughs> I, arguably I say you could shoot with this with three cameras and a floater comfortably. Right. right. You know, and yeah. if you want to get fancy, you might get a, a dolly one at the front of the thing, you know, up looking up. So that's five cameras. Um, five to six, I think you're good. If you have a crane, maybe a crane shot. Yeah. Um, but if one of those other two cameras are cranes, they should be on cranes if you can get them on cranes. You know, I think you'll be okay. But again, if look, if the yeah. client's paying for it and you get, you can handle it in post, knock yourself out. Yeah. Well, and I think it definitely depends on the kind of edit you're making because I think like if he's doing a full real time edit of the concert, then yeah, maybe you need a lot of cameras. But I think about a lot of the projects I do where I might shoot a whole concert. But the point is to make some sort of trailer for the artist. Right. And I can make two cameras at a concert look like 17 cameras. Because we're when I have because we come from as I like to say, the streets. <laughs> 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 we, we 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 come from a place where we can't afford nine cameras or fifty cameras right, yeah. sometimes. So we just we'll shoot it four K, we'll crop in, we'll do some stuff and we'll make it yeah. look good. Or we'll run I'll around shoot every chorus of the song from a different angle, and then you can edit it down and make it look like you had ten cameras shooting the chorus. And that's that's a possibility. I mean, uh, you know, shooting uh, shooting. And again, please forgive us, uh, who, uh, whoever sent this in. We Warren, don't, we don't mean to beat you up on it, but um, I was on a set when I was a kid in Miami, uh, and I happened to be on the set of True Lies, and because yeah. uh, he was shooting down there, and and we, I wasn't on the set, but I was like outside the set looking in. And all I saw was in this back of the back area, every single filmmaking tool you could own. 
technocranes, steady cams, right. a, a helicopter shot, like every everything. And I asked one of the people, them like, why does he have that? He goes, oh, he has it all there just in case he feels like using it. <laughs> so this is arguably the James Cameron technique, uh, where you just, you know, why not? You know, because you're James yeah. Cameron. And why wouldn't you as a filmmaker want to have everything there if you want to? <laughs> it would be wonderful, wouldn't it? Um, I don't come from that world. I don't think you do either, right. Griffith. So. No. <laughs> But to answer your question, no, do not plug in the audio, the mic to the board. <laughs> I think having redundant audio is good. It's good that he has at least two ways to capture it. But beyond that, you're good as long as those don't fail. Yeah, and you've got 15 other places. And I'm, yeah, I'm assuming the, yeah, as long as you're recording it off the board, I think you'll be okay. Right. I think yeah. you'll be fine. I just emailed him and told him to make sure he's monitoring it. Just check in and make sure you're actually getting it the way That's at the levels per- you want. You're pretty much good at that point. Yeah. <laughs> Our final question today is another audio question uh, from, this is a YouTube comment from Eric, who he's wondering specifically about a couple microphones I use, but I want to hear your thoughts on microphones too. He uses the Asden SGM, or no, he's asking about my mics. I use the Asden SGM 250CX, which is a $200 microphone. Mm -hmm. And then I also have the Rode NTG3, which is a $700 microphone. Mm -hmm. And I love them both, but I've done some tests and to me they sound about the same. So yeah. I've started using the cheaper one. Yeah, I when I was doing my first feature, I ran I, I did my own audio uh, as well, yeah. which is basically I had a a Tascam, a little Tascam and I had a Rode mic and I had the Rode it's the NG2, is it? It was like a 2 $300. Yeah. It was like 2 or $300. Yeah, so it wasn't and that one has the, its own battery inside, I think. Uh I think it's not the like shotgun. It could be. It's not the shotgun. Oh, it's it's oh, it looks similar to this. Um, okay. but it's the, but it's the road version. And, um, I had the, 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 the shotgun as well, but then when I got inside, I changed the two and I could tell the difference heavily between the two yeah. of those. Um, but, uh, I, I did a lot of testing and, you know, arguably these $2,000 mics versus a $200 mic, man, the, 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 the cost per value, the, the, the value of it, it just doesn't make sense anymore. It also depends on what you're doing and what really do you need. You know, if you're recording, you know, Adele, then get a $20,000 mic. Yeah. Y- yes. <laughs> but if you're shooting an independent film or doing some video projects, get something that sounds good. Do some yeah. testing between a few of them. But generally, there's a point where the value is not there. Uh, and I'm a big value guy. So that's why I love Black Magic so much because it's the best bang for your buck. Rode is also right. the best bang for your buck by, yeah. by far. I mean, $6,000 for a, an Ursa Mini versus 80000 for an Alexa. And right. if you shoot them both down the middle, I'll I'll put it up and see what you, you tell me, which right, is which. Yeah. We put the same lenses on it. We'll see what happens. Uh, and, and anytime I ever say that, people are like, "Well, it's an Alexa." I'm like, "Yeah, I know that." And the only the only place where a, a camera like an Alexa or a Red show their power is when you start pushing and pulling the image. You start going yeah. really low or really high. It's it holds the image, um, and then that's when the black magic starts to break down a little bit. But if you shoot like you should within two or three stops, always, um, you're good. Same thing goes for microphones. You know, like you know, as yeah. long as you're not going crazy and shoot it, you know, down the middle, you should be all right with a two hundred dollar mic. You don't need a two thousand right. dollar mic. I mean, well, I, yeah, shot I imagine into- your technique is much more important. Just like with a camera, you need it's to know how to the use mic- the microphone correctly. Yeah, get the mic as close as humanly possible. You know, even yeah. a fifty dollar mic close is better than a five thousand dollar mic five feet away. Exactly. It's just. It's just the way it is. Um, but, yeah, just always look for the best bang for your buck. And uh, with mics, there's no no difference than cameras. Right. What You mentioned that you used wireless mics on... Uh, on, on Corner Vigo Desire, it was yeah. purely almost all wireless, except for the, some indoor shots that we did the, the boom. Because I was definitely yeah. afraid of busting out a boom in the streets. Yeah. That tells everyone what you're doing. <laughs> but... But there was everybody had booms. I'm like, right. God damn it. We should have just brought whatever the hell we want and no one would have cared. You right. know? Uh, but yeah. And then in the fir- and then in uh, my first feature, it was all mics because I didn't have labs and I didn't have a sound guy. I literally gave the PA. I'm like, hold the mic as close as possible. Here. Here's the record button. Here's the stop button. Go. Right. And that's literally how I recorded all the audio for our movie. And... <laughs> arguably it sounded okay you know we got into post and 
I'm going to say 90% of the audio was perfect. My audio guys yeah. were like, you did this with that? I'm like, yeah, just, again, very low budget uh, of equipment, but it's how you use that equipment that really matters. I mean, look at uh, Tangerine, shot on an iPhone. Right. I mean, it looks gorgeous. It's just about w how you use the tool. Um, is uh, So there you go. Yeah. That's probably the best advice we could end the episode on is Do, just use what you've got at the best of its ability. It's not all about um, about having the ba the latest and the greatest. Don't get caught up with the gear, the gear porn of uh, of, of filmmakers. They always like, oh, I want to get this camera. I want to get this lens. I'm like, you're not even using the one you've got properly. Why right. don't you learn how to use that one properly first? You know, I shot my first feature on a 2.5 cinema camera. It's an older camera. Shot my yeah. second feature on a Black Magic Pocket, you Which know. Which is an even older, isn't? It? Or no, they're it's, about they're about the same. They're about the era. same, but it's just on 1080, not the magical 4K that everyone always yeah. speaks of. Um, and I was still able to crop in, and I was still able to make things. I'll be able to make a 2K theatrical DCP off of it. Yeah. You know, use what you've got, but learn how to use it properly before you go off and start spending. I know guys who have red package is sitting in their damn closet they have no idea what to do with it it's like right. someone handed me a someone handed me a keys to a lamborghini i'd be like that's nice but i've give me my prius i know how to run my prius i don't have no <laughs> idea what to do with this so it's the same thing learn le you know learn how to drive and i always find people uh, funny when they ask uh and this industry i think is the only industry that th they do this where they ask what your gear is like they ask what camera it, brand it is they ask yeah. what editing system you're on you know i'm yeah. like you don't do you, ask your plumber like which what, wrench are you bringing yeah, what what plunger are you using is it this brand of plunger mm, i don't know if you're serious and at the end of the day he's gonna put he's gonna flush that toilet either way um <laughs> there's no nuance in in plumbing um and i think and arguably you know at a certain point there are different flavors in image and, and audio quality but generally speaking it's we've gotten to a point where it's all look, looks pretty good yeah that's my feeling too. <laughs> well, if people want to follow the progress of your film, mm -hmm. I, I think the website is egoanddesirefilm dot com, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And I'll put that in the show notes. Yeah, that goes directly to uh, the page on Indie Film Hustle that uh, I will be updating as things come up. Hopefully, soon I'll know <clears throat> if I get into any <laughs> of these festivals or if I'm going to self distribute it. But that was also my end game. Like, if I don't get into any festivals, I could easily self distribute this tomorrow and make my money back comfortably and get it out there. My main goal is not to make money with a movie. My main goal is to get it seen by as many people as humanly possible. Um, yeah. In a respectful manner, not just putting it up on YouTube. Uh, you know, if yeah. you want to put your feature up, just get it in a place where. You know, because if I put a feature up on YouTube, you know, automatically everyone's going to go, well, that's not. Is that a real feature? <laughs> you know, like, it's, right. you know, I, and I know some people do that, but I, I don't. I'm old school that way. And you'd make like 20 bucks. <laughs> yeah, oh, easily. At least 20, if not more. Um, <laughs> YouTube and Google, the evil yeah. empire, man. I swear <laughs> to God. Took You know, you know, it took me freaking forever to get my youth, my first YouTube check. It took me forever. <laughs> it took me like six what months. Is it? Huh? Is it like a hundred dollars or something you have to reach? Yeah, to pay I, I was way over that because it was been building up for like a year, and I yeah. couldn't get that damn code. <laughs> I kept I'm like, <laughs> mail me the code so I could tell you it's me, and they wouldn't. Anyway, we've gone yeah. off the rails. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> well, if people want to hear more from you, I imagine they can find your podcast, Indie Film Hustle, in everywhere that there are podcasts. Pretty much, if you type in the word Indie Film Hustle podcast in Google, you'll find it. I'm in every yeah. flavor of player that you could imagine um and bulletproof screenplay podcast is also in the same area and of course the main hub is just indiefilmhustle.com which is yeah. where everything lives right well thank you so much for for being with us alex thank you so much for being it's been an absolute honor and a, and a privilege sir to be on your show thank you mr og <laughs> <laughs> well, take care thank you And I do look at the camera for the first line. Okay. I'm, I, all right. So I, should I look at the okay. camera too? Yeah, I guess you could Yeah, say, right. I am Alex Ferrari. I am Ferrari. Alex Ferrari, and I'm a filmmaker. I don't know. I'll figure something out in a yeah. second. <laughs> all right.